Congresso Internacional sobre Drogas, Lei, Saúde e Sociedade. Uma oportunidade inédita para se redefinir os rumos da política sobre drogas no Brasil. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure for me to return to Brazil, although my first time in Brasilia. Um, you know, initially, the organizers asked me to speak in the evening. Then they asked me to speak at three o'clock. Then I realized they wanted me to start at 420. But since I'm, in, since I'm in Brazil and we're on Brazilian time, now it's 430. So thank you for staying to be here. And for those of you who hope to march later, after we finish here, please go and march and speak for freedom. Now, I cannot be here and tell you the answers for your country. I can only share with you the experience in my country and what I have learned from studying and traveling around the world and a little bit of what I know here in Brazil. I think that many of you here, and hopefully most, see yourselves as being engaged in the beginnings of building a movement, a social and political movement for changing the ways that we deal with illegal drugs in our societies. Let me see, a show of hands, please, if you believe that, please raise your hand and let me know if you see yourself in that way. Uh, believe, see yourself in a movement of change in your country to change the way we deal with these drugs. So, I'll tell you, in my country, sometimes people look at us. They look at uh, me and my organization this growing movement, and our critics say, I know who you are. You're just the people who want to get high. <laughs> you just want to smoke your marijuana, maybe do your psychedelics, sniff a little this, sniff a little that, we know you. And you know what I say to them? There's a little bit of truth in that. <laughs> because in fact, for many of us, we do like our marijuana. Marijuana has been, overall, a positive thing in our lives. Brought pleasure and relaxation, enjoyment, new ideas, and the bad sides of marijuana are not so much. And maybe our experience with the psychedelics, oh, the mushrooms, LSD, MDMA, ayahuasca, have also been fantastic. And we do not see ourselves as criminals. We believe that our fundamental human rights and freedom extends to this area of personal behavior. We believe that what we put in our body is not the government's business. And it is also not the business of our employer, our business owner, so long as I am straight and sober and responsible 
in the workplace. This is understanding that these drugs are not just bad but good and that they involve our basic freedoms. But do you know who else we are? You know who else this growing drug policy reform movement is? We are also the people who hate drugs. We are the people who have seen how terrible drugs can be. We are the people who grew up cleaning the vomit of our alcoholic parents. We are the parents whose little brother is addicted to crack cocaine. We are the people whose friend is living with HIV or hepatitis because of their illegal drug use and bad, dirty needles. We are the people who wish there could be a drug-free society. We are the people who understand exactly how terrible drug addiction can be. We are the people who believe that there must be some addiction gene running through our family history which is why our grandparents and our uncles and our brothers and sisters and we fear our children will struggle with addiction as well. We are the people who wish that we could eradicate drugs from the face of the earth, but who nonetheless believe that the war on drugs is not the right way to deal with the reality of drug addiction in our society. We understand that to take a person, especially a poor person, who is struggling with drug addiction, and to say, you go to prison, not because you hurt somebody, but simply because you use this drug and are addicted, that's not right. It's not right when the wealthy people can use their drugs and even become addicted. And they deal with it privately with their doctors and their clinics. But the poor people get swept up to go into coerced treatment camps or jails or what have you. It is not right, and there is no justification in science or medicine for making a distinction between the person who is addicted to alcohol or cigarettes or pharmaceutical drugs and the people who are addicted to cocaine or methamphetamine or marijuana or heroin or whatever. There is no basis in science or medicine or ethics or even the Bible for making that distinction. So we, so we believe that no matter how much you hate and fear drugs, the war on drugs is not the right way. But you know who else we are? We are also the people who don't care about drugs. We're the people who aren't interested in drugs. And you know what? We don't see ourselves as drug users. I mean, maybe our teenage son is on Ritalin. Maybe our husband or wife is on Prozac. Grandpa is popping Viagras. We have our coffee in the morning, our wine in the evening. Who knows? But we don't see ourselves as drug users. But you know why we care? Because we believe in fundamental human rights and that we cannot make an exception to human rights when drugs are involved. We are the conservatives who believe that government 
must spend our money, the money of the citizens and the taxpayers, wisely. And that means to get the best result with our money so that our drug policies are grounded in science, not in ideology. We are the people from the left who do not believe that poor people should be treated as less than full citizens and who do not like the fact that most of the people being punished for drugs are poor and with darker skin, even though they are no more likely to use those drugs than the wealthy people with whiter skin. We are the people who don't like to have the United States government sending its police agents all around the world, violating local laws, encouraging foreign governments to spray chemicals on plants, taking away the livelihoods of poor peasants just trying to make a living. We are all the people who don't care about drugs, but care about fundamental values of the left, the right, and the center. So, who are we? Who are you? Who are we all? We are the people who love drugs. We are the people who hate drugs. And we are the people who don't give a damn about drugs but every one of us believe that the war on drugs is not the right way to deal with the reality of drugs in our societies. That's who we are. That's why sitting here among you, you may be the person who loves marijuana and you may be the person who started with marijuana and became a cocaine addict but we are here for the same reason. Not to celebrate drugs, not to demonize drugs, but to build a movement across politics. It is why when we look to the politicians, we can have a Cardoso and a Paolo Teixeira, we can have a William Buckley and Milton Friedman in my country, and people from the left. It is why we can have people who have spent 20 years behind in prison, for violating a drug law, and also we can have in our movement police officers and judges who spent 20 years enforcing the laws and now conclude it was the wrong thing to do. One's personal experience does not matter as much as one's values, as one's values. Now that's the movement. The question is, how do we get from where we have been and where we are now to where we need to go? And here I need to step back and to suggest that it is helpful to think about drug policy as a set of options arrayed along a spectrum. So at this end, the most punitive, terrible, cut off their fingernails, pull out their fingernails, lock them up, throw them in camps, hang them, Saudi Arabia, Singapore. At this end, the free market, the policy we had in your country and mine with cigarettes, 50 years ago, the policy that we have with uh, some other things. And I think the challenge of drug policy intellectually is to ask ourselves what would be the best drug policy? Where on this spectrum is the best drug policy? Now, how do you define the best drug policy? What is the definition of the best drug policy. And it seems to me the best, the best drug policy tries to do two things. First, it tries 
to reduce the harms of drugs. It tries to reduce the death and disease and crime and suffering associated with the misuse of drugs. To reduce all of the things for the individual and their family and their friends and their community and the society and the world at large. We know how devastating drugs can be. We see it with crack and with alcohol. And we even see it with drugs that are not so dangerous, even like marijuana, but for people who smoke too much and at the wrong times. But there's a second objective of drug policy. It is to reduce the harms of the government's policies, to reduce the harms of the government's prohibitionist policies. You know, in my country, we had the experience with alcohol prohibition from 1919 till 1933. What did alcohol prohibition do in my country? Well, in its first years, it was somewhat successful. Alcohol use seemed to go down. Other alcohol problems went down. People said, ah, oh, this is good. But then what happened? Did people stop drinking? Really? No. Did alcohol begin to become more popular again, especially for young people, because now it was the forbidden fruit? And who was now providing the alcohol? Legal breweries and distillers paying taxes? No. Al Capone and organized crime, as well as hundreds of thousands, millions of Americans making a little alcohol in their backyard or their bathtubs or whatever. Violence began to increase, shootouts in the streets, corruption, incredible corruption, organized crime becoming more powerful, the jails filling up with prohibition violators, the courthouses no longer able to hear other legal cases because of these cases. Alcohol becoming more dangerous because it was illegal. People stopped drinking beer. Instead, very hard liquor. Why? Because did Al Capone want to put on the trucks a beverage that was 94% water and 6% alcohol, or 94% alcohol and 6% water. More profit over here. We had shootouts on the Mexican border and smugglers from Canada. We even had people being blinded and poisoned and killed by bad bootleg liquor. Liquor that was alcohol that was more dangerous because it was illegal. When you bought it, was it ethyl alcohol or methyl alcohol? Was it going to make you feel good or poison you? What potency? We didn't know. And you know what else really spread? Hypocrisy. Because even then, who were the prohibition laws enforced primarily against? Poor people and people with darker skins. They were drinking in the White House and drinking in the college campuses and drinking in the finest clubs of the wealthy people. But the police knew not to go there. In fact, the police knew that if you went there, you did not arrest anybody. You sat down and had a drink. <laughs> well, now we see, of course, the crime and violence and corruption. The United Nations saying the global black market in drugs is worth three or four hundred billion dollars a year. Already 15 years ago, they said it was 7% of global trade the number one source of income for criminal organizations, the number one source of income for violent political organizations of the left and the right. 
Look in the ghettos of my country or in Mexico or in your favelas. And what is the number one business? The drugs and the drug traffic. Are the criminals involved in other businesses too? Yes. But where do they get most of the money with which to invest in other businesses? From the drug traffic, the easiest source. The corruption? Oh my God. Nothing corrupts so many people in government and especially law enforcement as this. And people, the, the dangerousness of the drugs? You know, sometimes I wonder if we had never made cocaine illegal 100 years ago, if you could still buy, if Coca-Cola still had cocaine in it, as it did in the 1890s, if you still had Van Mariani, the Bordeaux wine with a cocaine infusion, if mate de coca was exported around the world, if cocaine products could compete with caffeine products, and they're roughly the same, it's all the dose that matters. I sometimes wonder if we ever would have heard of crack cocaine, if it even would have emerged today. But drugs are more dangerous because they are illegal and people don't know what they're getting. And the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy, when the politicians sniff cocaine and the politicians grew up smoking marijuana and other wealthy people did it when they were young, but now nobody speaks out and they advocate to continue the drug war? Hypocrisy is not healthy for a democracy. And the waste of money. And in your prisons, you what? I read that prisons in Brazil are 60 to 70% over capacity, and that something like 30% or more of the people behind bars are there for drug-related crimes. You have a problem. Not as big as our American problem, because, you know, we in America, when it comes to locking up our fellow citizens, we're number one. Yeah. Go America. We have less than 5% of the world's population but almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population. We rank first in the world in the per capita incarceration of our fellow citizens. And when it comes to locking up black people, apartheid South Africa, move over. Our rates of incarceration of black people are higher than the rates of incarceration in the gulags of the Soviet Union under Stalin in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And we're spending 50 to $100 billion a year on this insanity. And now I read that your President Dilma wants to follow in American footsteps on the drug war? That they want to increase the penalties more so that your prisons, which are now 170% over capacity, can become 200% over capacity or 300%? Maybe you too will begin to develop a prison industrial complex with so much power that politicians tremble in fear, and where legal forces of industry argue for tougher laws so they can lock up more people in order to make more profits, and where the unions of prison guards do the same thing, so we from the left with the unions of prison guards and the right, the private prison corporations, both combine to lobby, to lock up poor, more people? Your President Dilma speaks that she does not want to criminalize poverty. The war on drugs is the cutting edge of the criminalization of poverty. The cutting edge. <laughs> you 
learn from our lessons. Now you have these proposals. We're not going to lock up the poor drug users. We're going to force them into treatment camps. We're going to form alliances with evangelical treatment organizations that do, are not required to demonstrate scientific criteria. Well, you know, this issue of religion and drugs, what do we know about it? We know that forcing people into drug treatment works for some people. But for many people, it means their destruction. We know that religious drug treatment is no better and sometimes worse than other forms of drug treatment. Now, it is true that if you believe deeply in God or deeply in some other greater being, higher power, something bigger than yourself, that that can be a good thing to avoid a drug addiction or to leave a drug addiction behind. But forcing somebody into a church or a religious program to be lectured by priests and ministers, there is no evidence that that is the answer and much evidence that it can land up causing those people to have even worse lives thereafter. The best way to avoid an addiction or to put it behind you, what do we know? We know first, as I said, that believing in something bigger than yourself helps. That the desperate egotism of drug addiction can swallow you. And to believe in something bigger is always good, a struggle, a, a divinity, whatever it may be. We know that falling in love can be a very good thing. And we also know that having your heart broken by the end of a relationship or the death of somebody you love can be the thing that trips you into an addiction. We know that having a good reason to get out of bed in the morning, a worthwhile job to go to, some reason to have to get up out of bed in the morning and work or study or do is also a good way to avoid an addiction or put it behind you. And lastly, we know that having a home, having just four walls and a door that you control, not the prison guard, those four walls is also the way to avoid or get out of an addiction. Why do so many homeless people use drugs? For some, it is because they are also struggling with mental illness and because they prefer the drugs they get on the street to the drugs they get from the doctors. But for many homeless people, what are drugs? Drugs are a way to create those walls around you for those few hours. They are the way to shut out the world, to forget everything, to numb yourself so that you are free from the oppression of living your normal life. Now, the government cannot give people who are struggling with drugs a higher calling. The government cannot help them to fall in love. The government can do a little bit to provide opportunities worth getting out of bed in the morning. And the government can do a lot to make sure that people have a private space of their own. 
That's what's needed. And the response that that is difficult or too hard or you just don't understand. And so therefore, we must sweep these people away, sweep them into jails, sweep them into coerced treatment centers because we're worried that the, uh, the world will come to Brazil for the World Cup and the Olympics and they will see our dirty little people. That's... No, that cannot be tolerated. You know, your president and many of your leaders, they remember the spirit, the, the time of political repression. And some know what it meant to be in prison and to be tortured by the authorities. Well, that memory should not be cut off here and say, but those people deserve it because of the substance they put in their bodies. That cannot be allowed. Now, I'll tell you something. I'm an American. I love my country. Most people love their countries. And my country has been for many years and will be for a few more years still a superpower. It's nice living in a superpower. And one thing about living in a superpower is that we want the rest of the world to be like us, right? That's what we want. It makes us feel good, especially if we feel insecure about what we're doing, like about drugs. What we're doing about drugs clearly doesn't work. We don't have the political courage until recently to change it. And so we encourage the rest of the world to be like us. Use our anti-drug ads, let our drug enforcement agents teach yours, copy our drug laws, do our drug courts, do, our, uh, you know, now forget about the science, just do what we do. So for many years, as I travel around the world, I apologize. I apologize for the evil that my government has been doing all around the world. I apologize. I apologize for the ways in which our policies have empowered the narco traffickers and corrupted governments. I apologize for the environmental harms that we are doing spraying the drug plants. I apologize for the human rights violations that we are supporting around the world in the name of the war on drugs. But I have to say, I'm feeling awfully good right now. Because I don't think I would have believed it. But now, my country, the United States of America, has emerged as the global leader when it comes to reforming and ending the prohibition of marijuana. It's extraordinary. It's inspiring. And I hope that you are inspired by it even as our federal government continues to champion the drug war at home and abroad, at the level of public opinion and civil society and state government, we are now the world leaders in the reform of marijuana policies. We are leaving the Dutch behind. 18 states have legalized the medical use of marijuana. There are between one and a half and two million people who are now legal medical marijuana patients. And thousands, tens of thousands of doctors who write a recommendation. Some of the people are very sick, with multiple sclerosis, with other muscular diseases, with dealing with chemotherapy of cancer, dealing with nausea. And some are using marijuana the same way people use a sleeping pill, use an antidepressant, use a drink of alcohol. But you saw what happened, right? You saw what happened in Washington and Colorado last year. 
I mean, I and my organization were very involved. It was started by people working in those states. But we helped them to draft the laws, to raise the money, to lead the campaigns. I did not think that we would win both, but we won both of those with 55% of the vote. In the United States, just so you know, in rough, every state, all 50 states, have a state legislature that can change laws. But half of the states, mostly in the West, allow the citizens to put a law on the ballot and vote on election day. And because this is an issue where oftentimes the public is ahead of the politicians, when you see drug policies change in America, it's typically because we were able to have the voters vote on a law. But you know something? In Colorado, the vote to legalize marijuana and regulate it like alcohol got more votes than Barack Obama did. <laughs> and in Washington state, it got almost as many votes as Barack Obama, and it got more votes than the Democrats who won the elections for governor and attorney general, chief prosecutor. We won big, really big. Two and a half years ago, when marijuana legalization, when they were voting on it in California, and a month before the election, Obama's attorney general, Eric Holder, made a speech, and he said to Californians, better not do that because it's all still illegal under federal national law. And some people think that played a role in our losing in California. Last fall, all the former heads of the DEA and all our former drug czars said to Obama and to the Attorney General, please tell the people of Colorado and Washington, don't vote for that. And you know what they did, Obama and Holder? They said nothing, nothing, nothing. Why? Because they knew that young people cared about this, because they saw that a majority of people cared, and they realized it was not good politics to oppose this. Now, this has happened very quickly. Public opinion is shifting on marijuana so incredibly quickly. It's very much, if you look at the public opinion polls on legalizing marijuana, and by legalization, I mean regulate it, control it, and tax it, more or less like alcohol or cigarettes, right? Went from 36% in favor and 60% against six years ago to a majority in favor now. If you look at the public opinion poll on marijuana and the public opinion poll on legalizing gay marriage, almost identical. For those of us working to end marijuana prohibition, we see the gay rights movement as our big brother. Why? Because it's about people having the courage to come out, to say, I am gay, or I am a marijuana user, or even I was a marijuana user, because also they involve fundamental issues of freedom, because also they involve issues where the wealthier and whiter gay people or marijuana consumers more or less are okay, but the poorer and darker gay people and marijuana consumers are the ones who are hurt by the government? What happened in America, I think can happen here too and in other countries as well. Now that means being smart. It means being smart about how we, how, we have a vision. We have a vision of ending marijuana prohibition in the move across that spectrum I described, ending marijuana prohibition is in, crucially important. So what does that mean? It means that our, the most important actions we take 
are the ones that cause other people who aren't sure about what to do about marijuana or who support the prohibition but not with any passion, our actions have to be intended to move them along. I mean, I like my marijuana and I believe fundamentally in my freedom. But neither of those are good arguments that helped us win in Colorado and Washington. What helped us win in Colorado and Washington were two arguments. For the people who were in the middle, for the mothers who were worried about their children, for the people who just didn't know what to do, two arguments. The first argument, let the police focus on the serious crime, not on this marijuana stuff. Let the police focus on real crime or even on things like domestic violence at homes. And second, we don't want the government wasting our money enforcing these unenforceable marijuana laws when instead we could be getting the money in taxes and taking the money away from the organized criminals. Those were the two arguments in almost every state that are the most powerful for winning the support of the people who don't really care or like marijuana. It can happen. We're going to keep pushing to other states in 2014 and 2016 and 18 and 20, and one day we're going to get there. I'm looking at Uruguay right now. Little Uruguay. Little Uruguay, where President Mojica says, what's the best policy on marijuana? His advisors say, well, we should legally regulate it so we don't have to buy all Paraguay's marijuana. <laughs> but they say we, it's not a good thing politically. And Mojica says, I don't care. You know, I don't care. Let's try it. Let's educate it. And they will vote this summer. So the race, the race is on. Who will be first in the world to set up a legal system to regulate, control, tax marijuana, allow people to grow their own? Will it be Washington, Colorado, or Uruguay? All I know is you're the biggest country in Latin America. You've got almost as many people as we do. We need you there too. We need you to grow as a movement and be smart and make this happen. And we'll help. Now, let me just talk. Remember, marijuana is only one piece of this. The other part, of course, is what do you do with the other drugs? And the fact of the matter is that what Portugal has been doing for the last 12 years, when Portugal changed its laws 12 years ago, and they said nobody goes to jail for drug possession for their own use, nobody, and nobody gets drug tested and thrown in jail, because they failed the drug test. And we are going to make a serious commitment to treating addiction as a health issue. And then the evidence comes out two years ago that in Portugal, this decriminalization policy and public health policy, it did not increase the number of drug users. That remained more or less the same. But drug-related crime, drug-related arrests, drug-related deaths, drug-related AIDS, drug-related hepatitis and disease, all went down. When a country like Portugal can make a commitment like that, what is the policy basis or the ethical basis for turning to a policy of coercion? Where is the justification for a policy of coercion in dealing with addiction when you have evidence that a non-coercive policy can produce as good or better results for less money and less harm? And you speak Portuguese, right? I mean, they write in the same language, more or less. 
Why listen to the U.S. government's approach? And when the United Nations agencies all... And when all the agencies of the United Nations, the ones that deal with human rights and children and AIDS, and even the drug control agency, issue a report last year criticizing the coerced treatment in Asia, now that's being considered here? I don't get it. We have another approach. So going back to that spectrum, here's the way I see it. We know that we need to move down this spectrum. We, need, we know we need to reduce the number of people in prison and jail for drug violations. And not just possession, but sale and growing and buying. We know that we need to treat addiction more as a harm reduction issue, as they do in Europe, and as you do in some places in Brazil, and we do in some places in the United States. We know we need to pull down this spectrum. We also know, we've seen with alcohol and tobacco, that, especially tobacco, that by increasing the taxes and having education campaigns and restricting where people can smoke, that we have had more success in reducing tobacco in your country and mine than we have in reducing illegal drug use in either of our countries. And we did both of these without using the criminal law. We know that we get to the best drug policy by as much as possible reducing the role of criminalization and the criminal justice system to here. And we know that with some of the drugs, we need to have sensible public health regulations and taxation and education and pulling over here. That we need, we need to find it someplace this medium is where we most successfully accomplish our objective of reducing the harms of drugs and the harms of government policies. If you ask me to define, to define what does, what does, how do I define the objective of drug policy reform in one long sentence? It is to reduce the role of criminalization and the criminal justice system in drug control to the maximum extent possible while protecting public safety and health. I'll say it again. To reduce the role of criminalization and the criminal justice system in drug control to the maximum extent possible while protecting public safety and health. That's the objective. I know that the best drug policy lies someplace on this spectrum between the free market and what I would call the public health harm reduction version of drug prohibition, essentially the European model now. What we need to do is to move both the public debate and the public policies from over here and over here, over here. I will know that I and we have succeeded when the debates that matter in Brasilia and Washington, D.C. are the debates that we have among ourselves right now. I know that I will have succeeded when all of my allies, from the libertarians and the total legalizers to the harm reductionists who are not ready for full legalization, I know that at that, the moment when we can take out our knives and fight with one another, that will be the mark of our success. But until we get to that point, our focus needs to be on moving the public debate and the public policy from over here to over here. It may be a bad moment in your country now because of the politics and because of the compromises that your president and your leaders have to make and because of the public image concerns with the World Cup and Olympics coming here. But now is still the time to build 
to try to stop the bad new laws from happening and to plan for the next years after the election, after the world events, to keep pushing forward. I know that we are engaged in a multi-generational struggle. There is no Berlin Wall of drug prohibition that will come crashing down. We have to take it apart block by block by block until it's small enough that we can kick it over and it will be gone. But we need to focus on that, to build this movement among those who love drugs, those who hate drugs, and those who don't give a damn about drugs. Among those from the left, the right, and the center. Among those working on prevention and treatment and enforcement. Among all those who believe that ultimately we need a drug policy grounded in science, compassion, health, and human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.